Good afternoon all. Liam Henry here from Collis, Ireland. I'd like to welcome you all to the first of a series of webinars being delivered by Collis, Ireland. Today, our webinar is about surface dressing and getting ready for the season ahead. This is a great opportunity and I'm delighted to be here with two of my colleagues, Jim Campbell, Chief Engineer, with over 40 years experience in both public and private sector in carrying out surface dressing throughout the network of roads in Ireland. Secondly, we're joined by Alan Anderson, uh, our emulsions engineer, which has gained a lot of knowledge in surface dressing within Colas Ireland. Today, we hope to present two presentations. We'll have a questions and answer session afterwards, and we look forward to all sharing knowledge on surface dressing for the future. So I would like to hand you over to my colleague, Jim, first. OK, so what are we going to be talking about? Basically, it's an, intended as an introduction to surface dressing. Now, I'm very much aware that the audience we're speaking to is an audience of mixed experience. Many of the people here will be well familiar with surface dressing. For others, it's a relatively new topic for them. We'll be looking at the purpose of surface dressing, pros and cons, how to go about assessing a road, different types of surface dressing, and on-site testing to be carried out during surface dressing. Okay, what is this about? We're talking about maintaining the road network in the country. The Irish road network, as you can see from the slide here, consists of over 100,000 kilometers of public road. Again, motorway, national primary and secondary, regional, county roads, primary, secondary and tertiary. If you look on the right of this slide, you can see the percentage of each category which is surface dressed. 25% of national, primary and secondary, regionals 75% and then between 80 and 93% on the county road network. When you average these out, roughly 82% of the road network is surface dressed. So for anybody that's working in road maintenance, surface dressing, understanding it and being able to master it is a critical technique to have. Again, our roads are subject to the pavement condition survey, which certainly any of the people in the local authority will be well familiar with, where a visual survey is carried out on the roads and they are then categorised from one to 10. Basically, a road in categories nine or 10 only requires routine maintenance, which could be drainage maintenance, markings, signs, street sweeping, any from seven to eight are in reasonably good condition, but do require resealing and restoration of skid resistance. Fives and sixes need localized repairs and surface restoration. Now, basically any of the roads in these categories require surface dressing either with or without a significant amount of preparation. Any in categories one to four require either complete road reconstruction or a structural overlay, which again may require an element of surface dressing. Now the next slide is showing some information I've extracted from the work of the local authorities and the road, road management office, which were published in the NOAC report a couple of years ago. And again, it's color coded in the same way as the previous slide. So those areas in green represent roads in very good condition. Blue represents roads needing surface dressing. Yellow repair localized and surface dressing. And the reds require structural overlay or a complete reconstruction. Now, given that the total amount of road here being non-national amounts to about 96,000 kilometers. You could take it, each thousand represents 1%. So very roughly, we have almost 14% 
of those roads regarded as being in a good condition. Interestingly, 35 and 29, which is 64 or 65% require surface dressing. So if you're involved in road maintenance, it's very important you understand this process and that you have mastered it. Again, a more recent figure here is from the NOAC National Oversight Audit Commission report published in December, which is summarizing the regional road condition throughout the counties of the country. Again, it's very much in agreement with the previous slide I put up. If you look here, you can see county by county and the different proportions of regional road and the condition rating given to them. Now, I would emphasize here, this condition rating has been applied either by the local authority or by surveyors operating on their behalf. It is not my assessment of the condition of roads. It is independent and is managed by the road management office and the information in it is fed into by the individual local authorities. So what is surface dressing about? Well, one way of describing it rather crudely is in surface dressing, what we're doing is we're sticking stones on the road. Now, the more, the more correct definition is, and this is quite, quite applicable, it's the application of one or more alternating layers of bitumen and chippings to a road. So what we're doing in surface dressing is applying a layer of bitumen in the form of a bitumen emulsion to the road and then applying a layer of specifically chosen aggregate on top of that. And I suppose the next question is, why would we bother? What is the purpose of surface dressing? It does a number of things for you in terms of road maintenance. You're renewing the skin resistance on the road, and that's a major contributor to road safety because vehicles traveling on our roads are totally reliant on good skid resistance when they've got to slow down or stop. Very importantly, the surface dressing, the bitumen layer applied, is sealing the road against the effects of moisture, and that prolongs the pavement life. It is a very cost-effective and durable method of road surfacing. Your minimum on site time, um, you will comfortably surface dress a couple of kilometers of road in a day. Uh, any other form of wearing course application, you're looking at a number of days per kilometer rather than a number of kilometers per day. Your time on site is much shorter than any of the other methods, thereby reducing the disruption and safety risk to the traffic. Overall, you're getting a solution which is suitable for the majority of roads and the majority of traffic conditions in this country. In relation to service life, you are not, in applying surface dressing, you're not improving the strength of the road pavement. But what is being done is that by providing the waterproof seal on the road, you're increasing the durability and service life of that pavement you are also significantly increasing the skid resistance available to traffic. And again, this is from the Department of Transport Memorandum on Regional Local Roads, published only in the last few weeks, where the department identifies the necessity for surface dressing. They say the application of surface dressing is most effective when it's preventative. It improves the skid resistance of the road, and again, as I said earlier, it provides that impermeable layer preventing water from entering the sub layers of the road pavement. If it's applied before or when cracks first appear, it's very effective in extending the life of the pavement. And again, that is my opinion, but it's not just my opinion. That is the stated opinion of the Department of Transport, who ultimately fund and direct the road maintenance in the country. In terms of durability, this is a photograph of a road which was surface dressed in 1998 using a 10 14 mil chipping racked in with a 6 mil. The slide there was taken approximately a year and a half ago. 
The road is between Athlone and Roscommon, carrying 7,800 vehicles per day, 5.5% HGVs. This road has now been in service for 22 years. It's a national secondary road, which means its skid resistance has been annually checked. Therefore, we can infer that this surface dressing is still providing an adequate level of skid resistance 22 years after being laid. In other words, a well-executed surface dressing has indeed got a very long life. And here is what we're doing when we surface stress the road. This is meant to be the existing road profile, our layer of bitumen emulsion, and our chosen high quality aggregate chippings applied and rolled onto the road surface. Over time, and with the effect of heat, our chippings become embedded into the road. Now, embedment has two things about it. Number one, it obviously will help to retain the chippings in the road itself. These chippings are very well bedded into the road and will resist plucking, tearing and friction forces very well. But do remember, embedment will only take place when the road is warm, as in above 38 degrees centigrade, which really is probably in this country no more than 10 or 15 days in a given summer. But also it's a function of the effect of heavy goods vehicles on the road. So the effect of this is that heavily trafficked roads will always need less binder because you have the effect of embedment than lightly trafficked. Equally, if a road is very heavily shaded, it never reaches that figure of high 30s, low 40 degree temperatures, and you will have no benefit for embedment. Therefore, you must apply more binder when you're designing that surface dressing. We'll go into this a little bit more now later on. And again, in terms of skid resistance and safety, this is a depiction of a surface dress road after or during rain. Because there are gaps between the chippings, the water is accumulating in between in the interstitial voids between the chippings rather than on top. This means that in conditions of rainfall, the vehicle tire is in direct contact with the high quality stone rather than been in contact with a skin of water that is giving you skid resistance where otherwise you might have none. Now, like every process, there are pluses and minuses with surface dressing. So let's look at those quickly. For it is very durable if it's well executed. It is probably the lowest cost per square meter wearing coarse material available. It's very quick to carry out. It's not a big struggle to do 30 to 40,000 square meters in a day if you have the right equipment and the right people doing it. It's giving you immediate safety benefits. Once the road is swept after surface dressing, you have an immediate gain in skid resistance. You're prolonging the pavement life. This, this is a number of pluses. Obviously, you're going to reduce your overall expenditure on that pavement over time. And you're also reducing the amount of energy and carbon generated through the process. It's a quick and flexible response to problems within its season. It can be relatively easy to address the skid resistance issue on a busy road in the month of May or June, but if it's October, November, December, it'll have to wait until the season comes around. It is applicable to most road and traffic conditions in this country. As I said, overall, roughly 82% of the national road network is surface dressed. And again, the limitations. It's seasonal and weather dependent. The real season for surface dressing is from May until August. It's a complex operation and you need to understand it. Everybody involved in the operation needs to know what they're doing. You need high levels of scale of all the operatives, be they drivers, be they on the ground, supervisors, foremen. You need a high level of site management and organization. And very definitely, it is not suitable 
for roundabouts or for use on stress junctions. Again, planning and organizing. You know, this is a good time of the year to be considering surface dressing, even though the reality is you won't be carrying any much out for the next couple of months. But now is the time when the local authorities organize their work program for the year. And in surface dressing, it's very important that you prioritize to get your busy roads done in the main season, which is June and July, if possible. There on the right is just a photograph of a very busy road being surface dressed using two crews in echelon because it's a big wide road to cover as much as the road as possible as quickly as possible and achieve a very high quality finish. Less trafficked roads can be surface dressed earlier or later in the season but again I would emphasize if you've got busy roads prioritize those for your main season and again be very conscious because it's Ireland just because it's the month of June doesn't mean the weather is good. You've got to watch the weather, pick your opportunity and then do the work. Preparatory work such as pothole repair, edging, drainage, verge trimming should all be carried out well in advance. And equally, if at all possible, avoid late season work on your busy roads. That's what the planning is about. Now, for anybody involved in the process, the essential reading is the IAT guidelines for surface dressing in Ireland. If you haven't already got a copy, go online to the IAT Irish branch, order a copy, get it, study it and understand it. Equally, the local authority training group has a number of courses on surface dressing, which I would highly recommend for anybody involved in the process where the process is examined and discussed in detail. You can learn a lot from these courses. And again, they're highly recommended for anybody involved in the process. But if you haven't got a copy of the guidelines, go out, order one, read it, study it. Now, within the guidelines, there is a method of designing surface dressing, which really ultimately gives you two outputs. One is the type and rate and amount of bitumen emulsion you're going to apply on the particular road and the other is the amount of chippings and I've just done up a brief example which is intended as an example of how to use the IAT surface dressing design calculator it is not a one-size-fits-all solution to all of your surface dressing problems so I'll just show you how this works again if you go on the IAT website you can download this calculator, which is essentially an Excel sheet. And it allows you to enter in the relevant parameters to complete your surface dressing design. The example I've chosen is for a lightly trafficked rural road, county road, and it's getting a single surface dressing. So again, looking at the sheet, download it, you start filling it out, who did the design, Identify the road, location, road authority. What surface was there before you started? This section here is merely recording the existing condition of the road. It doesn't affect your design, but it could very well affect your choice of method. For instance, if there's a lot of raveling and a lot of variability, instead of using a single surface dressing, you might consider an inverted double. In a, as a, as a a method of equalizing the road. But for this example, we're going to assume we've got a reasonably uniform local road carrying 400 vehicles a day, busy enough, two lane road, six and a half percent HCVs. I'll just expand that a little bit. Okay, here on the right hand side of your calculator, these really are the factors which are going to affect the design. This is merely a matter of record, the PCSI rating. Speed limit, again, matter of record. AADT, average annual daily traffic. This should be available from the local authority traffic count. If not, you have to estimate it. In this case, 473 vehicles per day. It's a two lane road, 6.5% HCVs. 
we will have measured the hardness of the existing pavement using a CTRA probe. Again, there's a short video coming up in a few minutes to explain that. And the texture of the road, the surface texture, again, we have a short video. Further down the sheet, as we go along, we have to choose the type of binder we're using. Here on a single surface dressing, on a racked in surface dressing such as this, my apologies, we're using a premium polymer emulsion. On a busier road, we might consider using super premium. We take our base figure for our design from the IAT surface dressing guidelines, page 20, and again, our base figure for our chippings from the guidelines, page 20. Now, from the values we have put in above, the calculator is already calculating for us adjustments to that base rate, as you can see here, to allow for traffic, commercial traffic, and texture. We need a couple of more entries to finalize this design. From the chipping grading analysis, we need to know the flakiness index of the chippings. Again, be careful because that can vary over the season. We'd recommend that you regularly test and evaluate your chipping grading and your flakiness index. Also, if you're using gravel chippings, which is unlikely, very few of those are used nowadays, and again, we're now at a value of 2.3 litres per square metre for our emulsion. This must be modified finally for site specific parameters. OK, very common, and especially in rural Ireland, a road will be partly open and partly shaded. If the road is shaded, you will require extra binder on the shaded areas. Again, that adjustment is all available within the IAT guidelines. Uh, the season, if it's late season, you definitely need more binder. Uh, again, from your grading analysis, the relative size of the chipping is important. It may be in specification, but it can be large or small within that specification. The grading analysis will give you that figure and you put it in here. And then we've now calculated on this example, our general rate of spread is 2.2 litres and 2.4 in the shade. So that's the rate of application of binder. So away we go and spray our binder, put on our chippings, roll, traffic control. This is a racked in surface dressing. So behind the gritter here will be a roller and then some means of spreading our small six mil chip and rolling that in again. Now, I've been quite a while involved in surface dressing, as Liam has said, and over all the years, while we have changed, our equipment is better, hopefully we're a bit better, but the basics of organizing and preparing for surface dressing haven't changed. You must assess each individual road on its own, each one of them is unique. You'll find with practice that some roads may be very similar. The only way to establish that is by examining them. Design a solution. The work must be controlled. The design is critical, but really it's irrelevant unless the design output is applied on the road. Control the work, record the work so that you know what you have done and you can learn from that into the future. And again, observe and assess the result. And again, as part of your aftercare, roads should be inspected some weeks and months after they're surface dressed. If problems are there and identified early, it can be very easy to fix them. If it's left run for a long time, it may be beyond repair. Again, in relation to assessing the road, here is just a piece of road pavement. Again, it must be done on site. This was a road where the local authority had identified a problem with skid resistance. Uh, an existing thin layer overlay where skid resistance problems had occurred. Now that was subsequently surface dressed using the normal technique you would use for asphalt concrete, using a pad coat 
and erect in 14 millimeter surface dressing over that very very successfully and reduce the problems on the road and in fact i think that might even answer some of the questions which have already been submitted to us in relation to these snas normally on an ordinary road we measure the hardness we measure the texture the traffic volumes variations along the length again is the road shaded does the texture does the hardness change along the length you may very well have a number of different solutions along the same kilometre of road. And again, allow for variations caused by weather. Always be careful of season when it goes late and the site conditions. If it's raining on site the day you're there, you can't surface dress. If the drying conditions are poor on the day, but otherwise the day is dry, you may need to extend your period of traffic management and control. Here is a typical surface dressing operation. Again, I mentioned variations on the uh, on the road. This road here is a regional road. And as you can see here, it's very variable in its surface texture and condition. Now, the solution on this case was we did an inverted double surface dressing on that. A pad coat sprayed at about 0.9 litres of bitumen emulsion with a six millimetre chipping followed by the main spray with in at about 2.2, 2.3 litres, 14 millimetre chipping, roller, racked in with a six mil chipping, rolled again and traffic control. But each roll does need to be considered individually. Again, you determine first of all, what type of surface dressing will you use, the type and size of chippings you're going to use, the rate of application of binder, Get the site prepared or materials well in advance. Um, sometimes in the middle of season, it can be very, very difficult indeed to get your adequate supply of chippings. If you're ready early in the season, then you're in a good place. Different types of surface dressing for different applications. Single surface dressing on relatively quiet local roads. One layer of bitumen emulsion, one layer of chippings racked in on the busier roads. We have done successful racked in surface dressings, certainly on roads up to about 20,000 vehicles per day at about 6% HCVs. With good management, a good crew, that can be done. In fact, the example I showed you earlier on was from a road with over 8,000 vehicles per day, 22 years on, which is not bad. Double surface dressing is used on very busy roads and high stress situations. A very, very good technique, but everything, because you've got two layers of bitumen emulsion, two layers of chippings, everything needs to be done very exactly. And again, for new construction on uh, Clause 804 and unbound aggregate materials, a double dressing of bitumen emulsion and chippings very, very common. One layer of emulsion, a layer of large chippings, another layer of emulsion and a layer of small chippings. Again, this is a very common operation, very successful, very much used on minor and low traffic roads. And again, just to summarize which type of surface dressing to use on which road. So you will have this slide, which may be of use as you're trying to make your mind up what type of surface dressing should I use in a particular application? And here is an example of the hardness test. Again, we're using the CTRA Road Hardness Probe, which first of all, we just press into the road to measure the depth between the top of the chipping and the road surface. We measure that. We've marked our spot on the road carefully so we can return to it. We now apply pressure onto the pressure pad of the probe for 10 seconds. By doing this, we're exerting a uniform force on the tip of that probe for a fixed time period. We measure the depth to which that has penetrated into the road. Subtract the initial depth from that. Record the road temperature and then 
we then subtract one from the other, correct our raw temperature to 25 degrees, which in this case of 24.6, we don't need to. So the hardness of this particular example is measured at six millimeters. No correction is needed on that. And again, the other on-site test is measuring the road surface texture. Very, very simple test, clean the road, apply 50 milliliters of uniform glass beads, it's no longer sand, on the road. We spread that out to achieve as near as possible to a circle on the road surface. Now, in general, I would be carrying out this test on the wheel tracks and repeating it a number of times to establish an average on the road. We measured the diameter of that circle four times and average it to come to the average diameter. And again, you're going to see in a moment where we're averaging that to get the road texture. This road is smooth. You can see the circle is actually quite large. It's 365 millimeters diameter, and that equates to a texture of 0 0.46 millimeters, which is a very smooth road. That is a major factor within our design. My last two slides show the same piece of road taken with two different cameras. One is an ordinary camera, such as you have in your telephone. Piece of road here, busy road. This is actually a national secondary road and partly shaded. The photograph is taken on a, a very warm day. And we also took a photograph using a thermal imaging camera. This here is the shaded area. This here is the open area. Just go back. Again, shaded area and open area here. Now, if you look closely on this, our temperature in the open is the road surface temperature is 48.5 degrees centigrade, while in the shade it's 25.2. And the reason I'm putting this up here is just to explain. I mentioned earlier on about embedment. This piece of road never will warm up because it's so shaded. It's sheltered from the rays of the sun. So therefore, if you're surface dressing on this piece of road, you must apply more bitumen emulsion over this area here than you do on the rest of the road. Very important to remember that. Equally, in terms of site management, no matter what day of the year you do the work on this road, this area is going to stay colder throughout the day. So the drying conditions here will always be poorer and slower than out on the open road. If you have shade on the road, you may well need to prolong your traffic management. Now, I'm going to hand you over to Alan. After he's finished, Liam will sum up, and then we will try and address some of the questions which you have already submitted to us. Thank you very much for your attention, and I'll be back to you in a short while. Thank you. I'm delighted to present to you along with Jim to do the surface dressing. So uh, a new platform for, for sharing information to you. I suppose the hardest thing for me and Jim was to condense surface dressing into two 30 minutes uh, slots. So we could talk to you all day about surface dressing. So the one thing I want you to take away, it's going to be on the last slide. It's uh, both Jim and my uh, contact information. So we we'll leave that up. Please take it down. And uh, if you have any personal questions, any questions about surface dressing in your area, your roads, please give us a call. Um, so I'm just going to go through a few things here. Again, if any questions pop into your mind, um, the idea of the seminar that I'm giving is kind of calibration, how, how it works, what it's about, um, the testing and techniques um, involved that you can do throughout the year. So a few a few helpful tips for yourselves. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about improved technologies, uh, the combi unit, and then at the end, I'm going to talk a little bit about Colas's Go Green initiative and um, a bit about our social media. So when we're talking about surface dressing, um, just so you know that surface dressing as a product is CE marked and Colas, when they're offering you surface dressing, it, it is CE marked and factory production control. So what does this mean? There, there are performance requirements for doing all in surface dressing. Um, so we have spe specific requirements for our materials, 
our rate of spread of our binders and a rate of spread of our chiptons. And then for each product, we have to do a type approval installation test on each of the, on one pair of the product every year. So again, just that's just some background information to the surface dressing. And um, we are also CE marked for our bitumen binders. So just I just throw up the two CE marks there the, for the bitumen emulsion and for the surface dressing process. Um, the next thing I'm going to talk about is calibration. So we do the calibration here in Galway, Sligo and Dublin. So we offer that facility. If you do have your own sprayers, you bring them up to us. So what are we doing when we're calibrating? As you've seen there, we check every jet individually to make sure they're working. The next test then is the slotted tray test. So we have to check the height of each truck, the pressure when we're spraying. We spray into the slotted jet for a, a set amount of time, 30 seconds, and then we measure the heights of the, the emulsion in the, the jet. Now, I'll put this slide up after, but we're checking the distribution across the bear, just making sure that it's, it's uniform. The next test then we do is we get the weight of the truck first, we spray it for a known time into the calibration bay, the computer clocks the litres, and then we check it against the, that the litres of clocks in the computer against the Weybridge docket. So we match the two. The computer unit then gives the driver the rate of spread, the speed to drive that to get the rate of spread. So that's just a, a service we provide. So just that you're aware, the calibration is done once a year on each truck. So you you know when you get your truck at the start of the year, it's it's in great shape and it's ready to do the job. So again, all of our Colas equipment are, are calibrated the sprayers at the start of the year. Here is just a facility in Dublin again. So it's a little bit more technical here. We, we have a, a laser that checks the heights and just gives that added security that your your distribution is, is correct. So what do we offer? So for yourselves, anybody that's out there checking the sprayer, if you wanted to have a quick look to see what, what, what the sprayer has, it has a calibration sheet. So on the, sh on the screen at the minute, I have a typical calibration sheet from ourselves. So it has the vehicle registration, so it identifies it as specific to that truck. The main two points you want to look at for each of the sprayers is the operating pressure, so that can vary between sprayer and sprayer, and then the height, so the height is the biggest one. You want to check the, to make sure that your, operate, your operator is working at the correct height. Again, it has the results for the tray test and the results for the computer, so that's on it. Um, I'll just show you the, the next slide. So with each of the calibration sheets, there is a, on the back of the sheet, it gives a list of the rate of spread and the speed to travel at. So each of the sprayers should be fitted with an RDS, which gives you the road speed of the truck. So for in the event that the computer system breaks down, let's say you have to spray at 2.5 litres per square metre, the driver is able to pick up this calibration sheet and sees that he's at 2.49. So the RDS gives that feedback back to him. So again, that's for yourselves. If you're out on the site, you wanted to check the sprayer, you want to check that it's calibrated. These sheets should be provided um, in every sprayer if it's calibrated. So I said I'd touch on this. The slotted tray test here is a, a section through it. And um, what we're looking for here is a uniform distribution through the through the the thing. So through the across the bear. So we see there's low and high here. This is one that, that has failed. So again, this is a very important point to check. So what can be the cause of this? Here on the left, we have the pressure. So if you're operating at the incorrect pressure, if you're too low, you have a smaller cone of distribution. If you're too high, you have a bigger cone of distribution. So what do we get when this happens? You see the, you can see here that we get this ridge in form in here. So again, it can be because of the height as well. So just ensure that these two things are working correctly. Um, I'm going to go on to the next thing here. So just, um, I suppose we do see different problems with different trucks. So again, we, we, we try to fix everything that we have. So on screen at the minute is a, a, an area where we did have a problem with a sprayer. So we brought it into the test bay and we could see that the distribution was off. We, we checked, it took us a bit of work. We, we found out what was going on with it. We, we checked through everything. And in the end, it turned out to be that the jets were, were, were in bad condition. So as you can see here, the picture before was the Warren jets. We changed this side, the left-hand side of the bear and they're the right ones. And just a, a quick comparison there, the left versus the right, the new versus the old jet. So you can see it was visible in the calibration bay. And then you see a new jet here on the left with that was kind of an eye shaped orifice. And then you see the it's hard to see here on the screen, but it's kind of squared off. So just as little a little bit of deformation, in the jets can cause a huge catastrophic thing on the road. So again, just 
to give you an example of the confidence that we have, we, we can, in, in the lads here, we, we go through the equipment, make sure everything is right, and by, by, if there is a problem on the road, give us a call, we'll get out there and try and solve it for you. So again, we have another quick test that anyone can do, and uh, you're, you're able to check on the road a quick test, um, it's called the dribble test. So on the dribble test, um, what we do here is engage the pump and uh, we just make sure that the, 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 the pump is, is knocked off. You press your spray bear and then the emulsion dribbles out. So that's hence the term, the dribble test, get the driver to drive forward and you can see the problem. So on this day, we had a, a problem with the, um, the uh, sorry, you can see here on the screen, you can, on the problem, there was, uh, there was an overlapping jet. So this actually came up on the carpet tiles and we found that it was heavier here in the middle. So actually the, this bear was, was deformed a bit and there was just an overlap. And by doing the dribble test, we were able to show the overlap in here. The next one here, we, we just knocked off that jet and we can see that we were back to normal. So just on the next one, um, this we were thinking we were seeing a blocked jet. So for any of you, any more, and this is a quick test, just as I said, disengage the pump, hit all the jets, fire it on, and you can see there where there was a jet blocked or not working, that turned out to be not working. And uh, you just count in there and you can see which jet it is and try and try and fix it on the road. Um, so why is this important? What the, I suppose this is um, a good job here on screen, you can see, um, and in the middle here, this, this was a, a blocked jet. So we know this because this distance here is the same as the distance here. So typically what happens was we probably drove this direction um, and then turned around and brought the surface dressing train back this direction. So we know that it was a block jet. This would have been an excellent surface dressing job if we didn't have a block jet. And uh, I suppose just to, to point that out that you, you make sure, do a dribble test and I would have spotted that early in the day. It probably cleared up after a while if it got clear, but that was just a, a, a point to watch out for. Points to watch out for when you're doing your surface dressing. Um, one of the biggest things in surface dressing is traffic control. So before, during and after. Um, as a bitumen emulsion needs time to evaporate the water out of the bitumen to give you your binder. The, 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 the aggregate has to go gray and dusty on top of the road and dry to know that the water is out of that emulsion. So if you put traffic on it too soon, the binder hasn't broken and it'll be pulling the chippings out of the, the binder. So again, before you want to make sure that your road is swept and clean, during you make sure that you have traffic control on it and slowing the convoy down until the emulsion is broke. And after, it's essential to make sure that your bitumen binder, your emulsion is broke and that the traffic is, isn't doing any damage to the underlying layers. Um, rolling, I suppose two points on the rolling. If you can at all, use a rubber tire roller. It gets into the deformations. If there's, if there's deformations underneath, it, it pushes the chippings into the binder quicker. If you have a steel drum roller and you have a bit of a camber or a high ridge in the middle of the road, it's not embedding all the chips across the carriage. So rubber tire roller and four passes if at all possible. If you're using a steel drum roller, um, just make sure you're not crushing it. If, you're, if four passes is crushing the chippings, don't, don't keep rolling it, just, just do as much rolling before you start crushing. Um, joints, again, If you, let's say if you're doing a double surface dressing, a 14 out of 10, you want to make sure the joints aren't overlapping every time. So you could have two 14s and two 10s, which is leaving ridges every time you have a joint. So the best idea is to leave a wet edge, get the gritter to try and grit up uh, to the wet edge. And uh, if you have any trouble with that, give me a call. I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that. Binder application, chip and distribution. I'll show you the two tests for that that you can do. Um, whether I'll talk a bit about that. And of the most important thing is communication on site. So again, spend a bit of time with the lads. Make sure they're familiar with each other. Um, tell them which way you're hoping to do the job. And uh, good communication. Ask the foreman on the site. Just just make sure you're all aware of what you're doing in the morning. So another kind of a great idea is to keep good, good communication on, on site. So here we have... Um, we're surface dressing in the summer and we got a big thunderstorm. So if this happens to you, don't panic. The biggest thing is make sure you keep traffic on the road um, slow the traffic down if you can at all. But most importantly, don't walk away from the site. That's that's my, my advice I can give you. So what we see here is we had surface dress the road. We got a thunderstorm. The day was lovely and sunny, thunderstorm, and then the sun came out again and 
and it was it was fine. So what we see here on the right hand side is the water. So again, it's probably more that it's just dirty water taking the the, the water from the emulsion away, and uh, it looks catastrophic. But again, after about 10, 15 minutes, when the water had kind of dried away, um, we get that we still see that the binder is stair under the chip, and so don't be don't be too worried. Again, it, it wouldn't be a perfect job. We got a bit of blacking on top, but again. Just be, just make sure you keep the traffic off until the emulsion has broke. So another point, busy in the season, we get chippings um, straight from the quarry. So again, as I said, the binder needs evaporation, needs to get rid of the water. So here we see a full load coming from the wash, the wash plant in the quarry. It was full of water. A tip here, back it into a lay-by, tip up the body, just let the water run out of the chipping. So by adding extra water, slowing down the brake, slowing down the time we can put traffic on the road. So again, just a, a, a quick tip there I'd like to, to share with you. Um, another one here, so um, people may be asking about the deformation underneath the road. So the best the way to get the best surface dressing is to make sure your, your layer under the road that your surface dressing on top of is uniform. So this can be done by doing a pad coat if you need, so a, a light spray of emulsion with a six mil, or like you see here, we had fatten in the two wheel tracks and in the middle of the road, it was kind of raw, it was, it was more open. So we decided what we did here was spray the middle of the road with just a, a layer binder. And then in the next picture here, on the day we had the two OB values, the two big combis here. So we were able to, to do this very efficiently. We sprayed down the middle of the road, the slight bit of binder, and then we came across it with a single surface dressing at the back. And we were able to know that we were having a uniform layer to spray on and we got a very good surface dressing after that. So again, for any just, um, I suppose the answer to the question is, if you have underlying layers that are ununiform, the best thing to do is try and make them as uniform as possible before you do your surface dressing. Another huge one when, with surface dressing, as Jim pointed out, the two the two components are bitumen emulsion and chipping, so aggregate. Um, so again, no more than the, the emulsion, the chippings are CE marked. You get they, they, they come from the product, they are CE marked. But as we can see here, the picture shows the same source of quarry, but two different stockpiles, I suppose. So on the left is a clean chipping, what you're expecting to get from the quarry. On the right is a very dusty and dirty chipping. So there can be many reasons for this happening. It could be just handling, storage, um, just, just overhandling of the chippings, really. Um, and to, when you're trying to stick the emulsion and the aggregate together, all that's happening there with the chippings on the right is you're sticking the binder to the dust and the chippings aren't actually sticking to the to the binder. So again, it's worth getting the chippings independently verified. So when you when you do that, um, this is what typically what you get back is called a grading. So the figure you're looking for here is what's on the 63 micron sieve. So we have a, a spec there of 0 to 0 0.5. A clean chipping is typically 0 to 0 0.2. If you're getting any higher than that, it's quite dusty. You want to talk to your quarries again and maybe talk about getting the uh, get the chippings clean again. Um, you, uh, the, the quarries do provide that. They'll bring it back and wash them again. But that's that's just on that side of it. Um, when you're doing a design, you need these uh, grading curves. So you need to know what typical size the chipping is. So is it a smaller chip and a bigger chipping? And then we have an adjustment for that size on the bottom here. Um, on this one, it's just zero. So it was a, a very uniform chip. Um, and then you need your flakiness index. So again, Colas have a database for all of these, uh, all of the quarries in Ireland. And if you're stuck for any of the information, please give us a call. And again, uh, even with our emulsion and our and all the chippings, please get them independently verified if you, if you think there's anything at all. So um, that's just a point to make out for. Um, now I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the few tests that we can do. So there are a few tests to make sure you have the best surface dressing in Ireland at the minute. So you can do a carpet tile and a chip box test. And Jim already talked to you about the sand pass and the macro texture depth. So when I'm talking about a carpet tile test, what am I talking about? So the carpet tile is a way of knowing what exactly binder you put on that road on that day. So we have small carpet tiles. You can have them 250 square millimeters or you can have them 500 square millimeters. You want to put it 30 meters in front of the sprayer, let the sprayer spray across it and pick them up and put them in the bag. So I'll just talk you through the process. We have our three carpet tiles there. And as you see on the right, our three um, bags pre-weighed. So you, you number the bags, number the tiles. You come, as I say, keep it in front of the, the truck so you let the, the driver can see what you're doing. Again, communication is key. 
the driver sprays across the tiles and then the, the most important thing is you pick the tiles and put them back in their same bag. Then make sure that the driver is aware, come out with a can of tar, fill in the squares that are left um, just so we don't have any layer without any bit emulsion on it, cover it up and then you're ready to take off again with your gritter and cover it in aggregate. So again, good communication with, with the lads on the gritters, the lads on the sprayers just at the stop and don't grit over your, your carpet tiles because your carpet tile is no good then. And just ask the driver what rate he's at, check the carpet tiles, compare with the two rates and then you're, you're, you're getting a good result. So that gives you the added confidence that the design that you, if, if you designed at 2.2, you had 2.2 on your carpet tiles, you know your sprayer was right. So that's, that's another a good point to do. The next one is the chip box test. So the chip box test is a very good test for checking your chipping. So again, a chip box is made up um, and everyone should have one of these in the boot of the car, in the back of the van when you're doing surface resting. So again, you place the chip box underneath the, the grit or whatever you're using. Make sure and keep it away from the wheels because the wheels will crush it. Uh, pretty obvious, but it does happen. Um, and again, keep it 30 meters in front of the gritter. So I'll just show you a quick video here of Dave placing the, the, the chip box on the left hand side here, the Phoenix. Just when you are doing a Phoenix, just be aware there's three different rates. The two wings are different to each other and the center is different. So we place the we place the chippings on the, the chip box on the ground, lay the chippings over it, replace our perspex sheet, and we have the markings up the side. So the IAT guidelines, as Jim talked about, it does give you a rate of chippings depending on the surface dressing you're doing. If it's 10 mil, 40 mil, and then you just check it on your box, what height, what height you are, and that that gives you your rate. So again, a great tool here to make sure you're not wasting chips, to make sure you're you're doing the right chip rate, and again, should be checked every day. When we're doing surface dressing, we check it every single day. So there are just a few tips for yourselves to get the best surface dressing. If you're doing these quality control tests, you will have excellent surface dressing, no doubt in my mind. And again, if you want training on any of that, give myself or Jim a call and we'll be more than happy to show you how to do this. So one of the other things I want to talk to you about is our new combi units. So just showing some innovation that Coles has invested in the last while. Um, these are our new combi units. Um, Mighty Machine, we had them out ready for last season, so they are available for, for hire and use. Um, I suppose the combi units is an all-in surface dressing. So we have the OB Varios I already showed. They're kind of for bigger bigger roads. They're, they're massive. Um, machine. These ones are kind of for a bit smaller operations. So, um, the, this this machine goes to 3.6 meters of width. So again, that's the added value on our older combis units, which were kind of 2.5 meter widths. The only you had to go back and do your strips. These ones, as it can be seen here, there is um, an extended spray bar here. So again, just just some of the innovation we have. Um, again, the tipper here is is it's a push plate in this so new innovation here these do not tip so great for going in between canopies of trees and wires to zero tip and um, it does all the single surface dressing after it all you need is a roller behind it and you have your your surface dressing done so again the it, the, the the technology in this equipment is is amazing it's, it's, it has to be seen to be believed so if you're doing some patching as i said maybe you have some some patches that you want to do uh, it might be two by three meters or even small little patches. This machine here, as you can see on the screen, um, you can just mark the boxes that you want in front of you and the machine automatically covers that area at the back of the machine. So again, huge technology there. If, you, if you're interested in, in using it through the year, please give us a, a call on it. And again, um, just showing you there the canopy above the, uh, above the road and showing the tightness that it can go up. This is a tight road and it, it covers and you have your perfect surface dress and ready for rolling. And, done in one pass. The next thing, and I suppose one of another major thing that I want you to take away from today again is surface dressing is seasonal. This screen, if you want to take a screenshot there or you want to look back on this, please look back and it shows your season. I suppose the season here for your different types of surface dressing, Jim put up a good slide there on the top to use them and want to refer back to that and then the recommended season for surface dressing. So um, we're talking about starting here in April. It's probably not going to be a problem this year. We'll all be we'll all be starting. We won't have much early work, but what could happen is late season work. And again, what we're talking about with late season work, you want to make sure that your road temperatures are for seventy percent 
you want to make sure you have a road temperature of eight degrees. So anywhere below that, you're going to struggle to get your, your a good surface dressing. Um, so the biggest point I wanted to point out here is the difference between your cationic 70 and your polymer modified emulsion. So with the polymer mod modified emulsion, we need a air temperature of 10 degrees and a road temperature of 12 degrees and rising. So this is hugely important. So again, when we get to that late season work, you want to be switching back to your cationic 70. And as Jim kind of already talked about, if you're using polymer mod modified emulsion, it's on your busier sections of your road. So do make sure that you get out and do your busier roads in that season that we just pointed out and then you'll have no problems. If you have any other work to do, switch back to the 70 and it will give you better better results. So why is this important? I suppose Jim already talked about this. I'll, I'll run through it a little bit quicker. Once you do use your polymer emulsion, the binder is a little bit harder, a little bit more brittle. Towards the end of the year, you do not get the added benefit, as Jim showed, of the traffic that embeds that chip. And we don't get the binder up after the, the season has ended in August, we don't get the road temperatures up but be above the 30 degrees we need to get proper embedment from the heavy goods vehicles to, to embed them chipping. So what you're left with is the chipping sitting proud. As soon as the frost comes, it's picking them chippings out. So again, horses for courses, pick your binders. Later in the season, use 70% binder. And I'm just going to show you some, some other work we did here in, in Colas. Um, Part fulfillment of my master's degree in, in road maintenance engineering um, was this project here we done. So myself and Jim, we did this trial. Um, and just to give you some context of it, it's we added a um, bitumen additive to our 70% cationic bitumen emulsion. So we got some amazing results in the lab, was the first part of the project. And then the second bit was a trial. We did this on a private road. So we designed the surface dressing. We've laid it in November. So in November, out of season again, um, the, the design we came up with was 2.3 litres per square metre of emulsion. Um, we, we reduced it to 2 litres and we reduced it further to 1.7. So that's what you're seeing on the left here is our normal cationic 70 emulsion at 1.7 litres sprayed in a November day. Um, and on the right was our new emulsion with our bitumen additive sprayed at 1.7 litres. So again, what we've seen there by adding the additive, I wouldn't recommend anybody to do a surface dressing in November with 1.7 litres per square metre, but just shown from our results, on the left hand side, we did get a lot of strip and did get a failure. And on the right, by using this small amount of additive in the emulsion, which we're putting into our emulsion here, you are getting that added benefit. So if anybody is having any trouble sleeping, there is um, my thesis there on the left that is available at IT Sligo and I was published in the Civil Engineering Research in Ireland 2020 and it's along with the Irish Road Research Network um, 2020 conference there. So please check that out if you, if you want any more information on that. But again, the 70% that's made with Colas here, it gives you that added security. Now I'm not, I'm not advocating going out spraying in November, but it just gives you an ad, a little bit added security when you are, if you do, under spray something through the air with 70% of your air getting that added added bonus. So um, second last thing I just wanted to mention about Colas' Go Green project. So again, Colas' um, campaign we're doing is a Go Green campaign to try and reduce our carbon footprint for the company here in, in Ireland and in, in globally. And again, that gives some added benefits to the customer. So we're looking to reduce our energy consumption. Um, we're trying to promote some of the low energy, uh, low carbon products, the coal mixes versus and warm mixes. And um, we're in the middle of developing a carbon accounting tool. So again, uh, we're looking to reduce the carbon of the company by 30% by 2030. So just um, if any of you are, are wondering what, what has that got to do with me or with, with you, um, Surface dressing is a low carbon option. So again, if anybody, any of your bosses are asking, what are you doing this, helping the environment? What's, what are you doing? Surface dressing is one of the, the quick wins for you. And, and it, is, it is already a green technology when it's using the bitumen emulsion over a hot mix. Um, and again, it provides your, with your uh, high level of skid resistance and it seals the pavement below. So again, a, a huge advantages there. But that was a, just a quick point I wanted to make there. Um, again, our Colas Ireland social media, I'll touch on this. We have a YouTube account, as you can see here, some great videos. There's actually a mighty video going up of the Combi unit there. So please check us out there, Colas Ireland on YouTube. Um, we're on LinkedIn. Again, we put up things every second week, every week, um, what we're doing at the minute. Please check us out there. And 
Lastly, if you have any more information and um, you want to look at the website there, we have an excellent website. Click in there, you'll get all our, our contact information, anything else you want. And again, the one thing I wanted to take out of today was both mine and Jim's contact details, our phone numbers, our email address. And thanks very much. I hope we have loads of questions to answer there now. And I'm going to pass you back to Liam Henry. Thanks, thanks very much, everybody. So what I would suggest is that we will focus on a few questions because I I, I do understand that the webinar has gone over the hour at the moment. And what I will guarantee is that Jim and Alan will answer all questions in the next few days. So look, just to start off the question and answers session, I, I, there's questions coming in from all sides of the house. And one that I, I would put to Jim at the moment is based on the use of say SMA and 20 mil asphalt concrete a lot of questions were coming in about the surface dressing and when it can be performed and how we can blend both systems into one. So maybe, Jim, we might pass over that question to you first. Thank you. Thank you, Liam. Yeah, I, I've been watching the chat box there as Alan was speaking, and we have quite a number of questions on this. Basically, the reason you're surface dressing the SMA is to provide skid resistance and also an enhanced seal on the road to protect the underlying pavement. The method of doing it is the same as any other asphalt concrete material. Go to the IAT guidelines. We'll seal the road with a light application of bitumen emulsion, followed by a two stroke six mil chipping, and then the main wearing course on top of that. Uh, somebody did ask the question, if the road is partly SMA and partly old surface dressing, again, that would be very typical of trench reinstatement. Again, the treatment there would be that we seal the SMA area and then surface dress over the entire road. Now, again, please be careful. This is work which should really be carried out during the main season. In other words, May, June, July and into August. If it goes later than that, you may run into problems because these are very hard, unforgiving surfaces. However, with that said, there have been a number of instances in recent years where we have been involved in surface dressing, existing SMA on bad bends, uh, high stress situations, areas where there were traffic safety concerns, and the work has been successfully done and has reduced the amount of safety worries on particular locations. Does, does that answer the question? Look, Jim, Jim, I'm sure it does. And if that particular person or persons that asked that question needs to know any more or any other information, please feel free to contact Jim and his details are also will be at the end of this presentation. I suppose the second question and it's interesting to myself to see it is obviously the job that we think today is lovely, Jim and Alan, and everything's going perfect. We go along, we buy our emulsion, we make sure the sprayer is of a working quality and so on. And then we end up with the pictures that we see here. So really, Jim, I'm asking you again, have you any kind of suggestions? How do we minimize the risk of a job like this happening because no one wants to see a value for money concept being wasted like what we see in the pictures today. Okay, Liam. Well, looking at these, and I haven't seen the road itself, and I'm not aware of exactly when or weather conditions when the when the work was done. But a couple of things that immediately occurred to me. It doesn't appear that the application of binder is uniform across the width of the road there appear to be streaks and lines in it. Now, Alan has already touched on this in his presentation. Again, I would be looking at the sprayer in this case. Check that the sprayer is in calibration. Check that it's been operated at the correct bar height, the spraying temperature, and that the pressure is correct at the time of spraying. Also, I would wonder have the filters on the pump, which is pumping the emulsion to the spray bar, have they been maintained and cleaned? But again, without seeing the road and discussing it in some detail with the people involved, 
I can't say exactly what has happened. Equally, your on-site carpentile test possibly would have revealed problems with the distribution of bitumen on the day. So my next step with a road like this would be whenever we're allowed, get into my car and go and have a look and a good a good a good inspection of the road and a good chat with the people involved. But this thankfully is rare and it is avoidable. That, look, that's great, Jim. And again, I would suggest and you have answered myself that when we're allowed when we're allowed to uh travel again like here in Colas we have no problem going out and looking at a job like that because it's in everyone's interest that the performance of surface dressing meets the criteria that's set which is 100 percent so listen thank yeah. you for that i think alan just in case you think i'm forgetting about yourself i said there's one or two or a few questions in about the quality of chips and ce marking and factory production control and you know on i think it was your slide alan you could see you know the quality of a wash chip is to one that might not be as washed as much so i wonder could you kind of say add your opinion on the quality of chips the market out there the ce marking and the way we can manage that to ensure that we're ready for the season and that we get very good quality work at the end of the day. So I'll hand you over to Alan now. Thanks, Liam. Yeah, I guess I suppose I did I did point on that in my uh, presentation. So what I suppose the question is asking, what what should you be getting? So if you are get when you are getting them from a quarry, the RC marked again, you want to be getting the grading. So from from the um, the labs in in the different quarries, you want to make sure that you're getting the dust content again. The as I said, the um, the size then again towards the uh, when they are surface dressing chippings, you want to get this information. Again, if you want to make a phone call here, we, we test them all the time, the different qu the quarries. Um, if you have a few samples you want to send to us, we will, we, will, we will check them. But again, I want to stress to get them independently verified if you can at all, if you, if you have any issue with them. And again, I suppose throughout the year, it is essential that you, you do check your stockpiles because you might get someone over eager on a on a, a loading shovel or something on a, a high mac i've heard them just cleaning up the thing they're thinking they're doing mighty work getting extra chippings but you do know the ones that's been drove on and on the ground are dirty chips so the it's 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 a kind of a a management issue sometimes and and sometimes it can be from the quarries but again just just take regular samples and check your chippings and um again a quick test that, that jim jim actually showed me was just take a handful of chippings rub them together check your palms there should be no dust on your palms and if you are having dust on your palms you want to be thinking they're dirty like that's that's a question I, I hope that answers it for the person then um, and again if you have any any troubles with it i'll, I'll more than happily come and and and, and have a look with you or Again, we will we'll take samples and have a look at that. But uh, again, my my um, try and get them now rather at the beginning of the season rather than at the end of the season. And um, when you find you have problems, it's better to have have a look and make sure that they're right and, and uh, give you every chance with your surface rest. And I hope that answers the, the question. Look, Alan, that's a great answer and a fair play to you for, as I would say, answering it very black and white. Look, I understand. Time is moving on fast also. But Jim, there's another maybe two or three questions I'd like to pose to you. And one of them is about a raveled road. And you can see it there in front of you. You know, like where you have a road surface, some of it has a lot of chipping on it and some hasn't. And I think the next question will fill into this also is, and I, it's at, it's at the heart of when you consider we manufacture our own chemicals to manufacture quality emulsions. Like, is there any test out there in house more than likely to check the adhesion of the chips to the emulsion? And when you kind of consider that question about the Raven Road, I think both of them lie in to each other to answer that. And you might give us an opinion on that, Jim. OK, well, in relation to the Raven Road, um, the treatment I would use on that most likely is an inverted double surface dressing. Similar to the slide I showed earlier, showing the partly stripped road where we have used a pad coat with a binder and six mil chip followed by the main surface dressing. We have found that to be very effective on a number of the, on a good number of these sites over the years. 
Equally, I noticed from the chat box, somebody has asked the question, does that address the variability in the road? And the short answer is yes. We have done some very variably surface roads using this technique and done it very successfully. In relation to adhesion testing, while it is not part of the specification of either the binder or of the uh, chippings, there are adhesion tests available, which as anybody in house and call us knows, are widely used as part of our testing of our various additives for bitumen on a regular basis here. Uh, and they can be done. Um, again, the major problem with adhesion, certainly historically, would have been a simple problem of dust. If the chips are in any way dusty, and as Alan mentioned, even if you haven't got your laboratory available when you're out at the stockpile, take a handful of chippings, rub it between your two hands, look at your palms afterwards. If your hands are clean, the chippings are clean. If your hands are dirty, it's time to think about taking a sample and getting it analysed. But yes, the adhesion between the bitumen emulsion and the chipping can vary, and that very much depends on the chemistry of the stone. Now, we can carry out, and various laboratories can carry out some, uh, ex some tests on that basis, but they do not form part of specification as we stand. Thanks, Lynn. Look, thanks, Jim, and again, that's an excellent answer. And look, in my years and experience in Colas, I like I always remembered, Jim, that you were part of the working group for coming up with a strategy for a, for digging trenches and how to reinstate the existing roadway to make sure it meets the quality that the sta all stakeholders or the end user wants. There is a question in there, Jim. I think it's down to your feeling. You know, how how do we deal with trenches and reinstatements? And look, I do, before you answer that question, Jim, I am coming to an end because I understand the time constraints that's in it. And uh, with, like all the other questions, we will answer into the future. But you might focus on Jim, say a trench reinstatement and what you would suggest. And then I have one question to put to both you and Alan before we finish and I close it off. So I hand it over to you again, Jim. Okay, well, trench reinstatement. Firstly, the reference document is the purple book on trench reinstatement from the Department of Transport. And I noticed we had a couple of questions coming in through the afternoon on this. Uh, basically, one of the questions is where the trench is reinstated in some form of asphalt concrete. Now, this particular question is actually quite spe specific in that this road is what is defined under the trench reinstatement document as a protected road. And because of that, if the road is more, more than five and a half metres wide, the entire lane pavement must be renewed. The question we were asked there, the pavement layer is 75 mils thick. Should it be removed completely and replaced or plane out 40 mils? My answer to that is by planing out 40 out of 75 mils, you're leaving a relatively thin layer of old paving in place and your next layer of paving is quite thin. Subject to the advice, say, from the Road Management Office or the Department of Transport, I would say you take out the structural layer, repave, and then the next question is about surface dressing on the asphalt concrete where course on which is newly laid that can be carried out the same day or the next day as the asphalt concrete is laid provided the asphalt concrete has had time to cool to the ambient temperature uh, seal it apply your surface dressing roll it very good traffic control and you should have a good job uh, sorry the other question was in relation to late season sealing of asphalt concrete overlays. Again, this is something which needs to be done very, very carefully. Uh, if it is essential to do it, you must choose good weather, sp spray at slightly heavier rates than you would normally use for sealing this material because you now want the chipping, the six mil chipping to stay in place 
for a number of months. I would say at about 1.2 litres per square metre. Ensure that the chippings are dry. If you have a fresh stockpile of six mil chips, they will be very wet. If it's late in the season, drying will be very slow. Equally, and this is a matter really for the senior engineers within a particular local authority, is it adequate to treat that as an unfinished road surface, mark it up and sign it up accordingly, and wait until the next season to surface dress it properly, which would be my personal choice if that is acceptable to the local authority. Okay, Liam, that's as much as I have to, to add on this one, I think. Uh, look, Jim, again, <laughs> the knowledge you have, you know, <laughs> it's great, and it's great to have someone like yourself in the industry and actually mentoring Alan and the rest of us to reach that level. Just as I said, that I, I understand the time is moving on, and I think it'd be very important, and I'd like to pose this question on behalf of myself in Qualys, Ireland, to the likes of yourself and Alan, and probably to the, the, the whole community as such, because surface dressing is such an important road maintenance technique for Ireland and the way we handle our network. I think health and safety should be the core objective of anything we do and the dangers that comes with carrying out roadworks at any time of the year. So just to kind of, before we finish off, is there any tips both you and Alan should share with all of us to ensure that when we are carrying out surface dressing, that the highest standards in health and safety is achieved for both the public, for the people that's doing the job, and for the job to be completed safely? I just kind of one or two opinions from both of you before we close it off. Again, I suppose, uh, Liam, to answer your question, I uh, I did I did mention it in my presentation. I suppose communication on site is is a huge one. So, look, we do have a lot of people um, on on site on surface dressing sites. A lot of a lot of people there to to um, do the work. So again, just make sure that everybody is aware of what they're doing, where people are. Um, a lot of members of the public as well. So just, just um, I, I suppose, relay everything to, to the people in the morning. First thing, um, I know with our, with our surface dressing, um, if I'm on site, I'll do a toolbox talk. We'll, we'll go through some of the information with, with the lads. Again, every, every job is different. So again, just make sure you, you use who you need, what you need on the site. Don't be having excess people around just for the sake of it. Um, try and control traffic, people coming in and out, um, and only only use what you need. I suppose that, from, from my point of view on, on health and safety, that's 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 the biggest thing you can do is just just manage things. Make sure make sure you're wearing as much PPE as you have or, or you, you use, and um, the more you have, the, the better it is to be seen. Um, again, I suppose, yeah, just just stay out of any, any, any areas you think is dangerous and just, just, just always be aware of, of the people driving. There's an awful lot of blind spots on different machines, so just try and make yourself aware. And um, sometimes you think you can be seen, and you mightn't be. So again, just, just, just be very vigilant on the surface dress. And we do, we all get, we all get um, relaxed when we're doing it so often. But even myself doing carpet tiles and chip box tests, you think everybody knows. But again, just tell everyone what you're doing. Spend five, ten minutes just, just pointing out where you, where you are, what you're doing. Um, and just keep an eye on all the heavy machinery. Again, it's, it's, there's a lot of it in, in, in what we're doing. So um, again, as I pointed out with the with the all-in surface dressing, you're on the combis, another huge, it's, it's safety is, is massive with that machine. It's it's just, it's cutting down on the amount of equipment you're using, the zero tips, all, all the different things. Um, another point to watch out for, I suppose, is overhanging trees and things. We kind of we kind of forget that we're tipping some trucks into different things, and we can t hit the trees, and the branches do come down. So, again, just I suppose Liam to answer your question, uh, be vigilant for yourself, safety. Watch out for yourself. Make sure you're 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 keeping an eye on everything that's going on, and and uh, and and keep safety. I don't know, Jim, if you can add to that. Well, from my experience, it really the safety on the site and the quality of the outcome almost run parallel to each other. The site needs to be well organized, well planned and well managed in order to get a good outcome of the work. But equally, a well planned site is a safe site. Now, again, a couple of quick tips for people is, for instance, we've come across this a few times on very steep sites on hills and sometimes on mountains 
where we're not satisfied that we can use trucks reversing uphill or downhill while tipped and the potential dangers there. Again, your combi unit or your OB Vario are a much safer alternative. And it may well be the best idea to pick those one or two jobs out of your entire program and put them aside to be done using that equipment, irrespective of what you're doing on other other jobs. Equally, Alan, you mentioned communication. That is critical that everybody on site understands what their particular function and responsibility is and what their job is and be aware of what other people are doing around you. And again, a well organized site that will be pretty obvious. Again, I would stress for anybody involved, there are excellent specific training courses available through the local authority training group and I would highly recommend that anybody involved would attend those and you learn from those as well. So those are those are my immediate thoughts on that topic. Look, uh, again, thank you very much for such direct answers. And uh, look, we're coming to an end now. As we say, you know, this was our first webinar and like, you know, like the presentations of both Jim and Alan, you know, it brings uh, what they call a great benefit to the surface dressing technique. And it makes me being proud and part of Colas Ireland. And I want to thank Alan and Jim for the effort and the high standard of presentations. Look, moving forward, it was a pleasure to be kind of the host. There's not often I host an event like this. And uh, I want to thank everyone for helping us do it. I would encourage everyone to keep an eye on social media because as I said at the beginning, this is the first of a series of webinars that Colas Ireland intends to deliver in the next few weeks in order to get ready for the season ahead. Secondly, I think it would be wrong of me not to allude to our Go Green strategy. Colas Ireland is launching a Go Green strategy based on sustainability into the future. And in the next few weeks, we hope to share it with all local authorities around the country. This will be led by our technical manager, Alan Kavanagh, and it will answer questions that people are beginning to answer about total life cycle of road solutions and road solution techniques. So listen, I would encourage you all to keep an eye on social media and uh, see what Colas Ireland can offer the end user. So finally, I would like to thank all the participants on today's webinar. Believe it or not, there's over 180 people listening to us today. We did not get a chance to answer all questions but we will, we will answer them in the next week or two. And I would encourage anyone that needs any help in getting ready for the roads budget. There is a list there of Colas employees that's there to do the technical backup for us. And once again, I want to thank you. And in particular, I want to thank the IT team, Carl, Jonathan, Ding and David. So thank you and please be safe and enjoy the rest of the day. And I do look forward to meeting you all when we're allowed to get out of our cocoons or our bubbles in the near future. Thank you for listening and take care. To find out more about Colas Ireland, please visit our website or if you would like more information on our products and services, please go to the contact us section of our website where you will find key contact information. Also, please check us out on our YouTube channel and LinkedIn page to keep up to date with the most recent news and information.